This lecture is brought to you by Megger, a leading manufacturer of electrical test and measurement equipment. I've trusted Megger's equipment for years and have witnessed firsthand their commitment to education and supporting technical schools across the country. For a limited time, Megger is offering my viewers an exclusive discount on their next purchase on products sold through U.S. distributors. Simply visit us.megger.com slash bigbadtech for all the details. Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is the superposition theorem as applied to DC circuits. Our objective is to learn to employ the superposition theorem in an effort to solve our desired electrical properties for circuits with more than one source. Bottom line up front, the effects add up. The superposition theorem is the simplest and most reliable of circuit analysis techniques because it makes so much intuitive sense. When tasked with carrying a couch upstairs with a group of your rowdy friends, it helps when they're all pushing in the same direction. If one of your stupider friends is under the assumption that you're moving out rather than moving in, their opposition reduces the resultant effects. If you are the stupid friend opposing everyone else's combined efforts, your smaller contribution will be overwhelmed. Long story short, don't have stupid friends help you move a couch upstairs. Ask me how I know. As applied to electrical circuits, the superposition theorem is simply series parallel circuit analysis of the same circuit with multiple sources from the perspective of each individual source then the individual results are summated, accounting for magnitude, polarity, and direction. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers skilled in the contents of the DC series parallel circuit analysis lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, only dim and recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. In addition to reliable series parallel circuit analysis skills, one must also have a modicum of organizational ability to properly apply the superposition theorem. Regarding polarity and direction, one must differentiate between left, right, up and down. I'm your electronics instructor, not your mama. I cannot teach you to be organized. Your mama should have taught you to put things where they belong and the difference between right and left, up and down, and good and bad. The only judgment I'm making about you is whether you're right or wrong. Stay organized and remember to account for direction and polarity. If we know source 1 pushes 1.5 amps of current through a 10 ohm resistor right to left, source 2 pushes 0.75 amps of current through the same resistor left to right, and source 3 pushes 0.25 amps of current through the same resistor left to right, the summation of these three currents is 0.5 amps right to left, and it is not 2.5 amps. If you cannot understand and differentiate between the utter rightness and the sheer wrongness of these two diametrically opposed results, send me your mama's phone number because I'm going to call her up and have her slap you silly for being messy and unorganized. This housekeeping trick also works for voltage polarity. Given the previously mentioned current directions, source 1 would induce a 15 volt drop across this resistor, positive to negative, right to left. Source 2 would induce a 7.5 volt drop across the same resistor, positive to negative, left to right. And source 3 would induce a 2.5 volt drop across the same resistor, positive to negative, left to right. Accounting for polarity, the summation of these individual voltage drops would mean this resistor would ultimately experience a 5 volt drop, positive to negative, right to left. It is an act of sheer wrongness to suggest this resistor experiences a 25 volt drop. A swat of your mama's firm but just hand will attest to this wrongness. Wrapping back to our earlier current summation, Ohm's law demonstrates a 5 volt drop positive to negative right to left across a 10 ohm resistor would induce 0.5 amps of current traveling right to left. Similarly, another application of Ohm's law demonstrates a 10 ohm resistor experiencing 0.5 amps of current traveling through it right to left would experience a 5 volt drop positive to negative right to left. This is to suggest that voltage and current summations should be supportive of one another and there exist ample opportunities to check your work via Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and or Kirchhoff's voltage law. Now before you run off under the mistaken assumption that superposition theorem is the best thing since they replaced the turd brown M&M &M with a blue one, let me warn you that the superposition theorem has its disadvantages, tricky spots, and limitations. The principal disadvantage of the superposition theorem is that it requires independent analyses of the same circuit from the perspective of each source. If your circuit has two sources, this means two independent analyses and a final summation. If your circuit has three sources, this means three independent analyses and a final summation. If your circuit has 100 sources, you may wish to investigate the use of a computer to solve for desired electrical properties. You get my point. Other circuit analysis techniques like mesh and or nodal analysis can yield the same results in a single admittedly convoluted step. However, they necessitate special math skills with very little carryover value outside these limited circumstances. This being said, the reason I'm such a big fan of superposition is that it yields reliable results using skills you should already feel comfortable with applying, 
notably traditional series parallel circuit analysis. Why learn special skills like mesh or nodal analysis when the skills you already have yield the same results? This being said, the superposition theorem has some attached trickery. As we'll learn later when we dive into the illustrated example problems, the superposition theorem necessitates removal of sources not currently under consideration with the incorporation of shorts or opens. The addition of shorts or opens may fundamentally change the nature of the as-analyzed circuit. Recall that opens present infinite resistance through which no current will flow. Conversely, shorts present no resistance which all current will flow in preference to other paths. We'll discuss these modifications in greater detail when we've learned to apply the superposition theorem to the illustrated example problems. Finally, the principal limit of the superposition theorem is that of linearity, and that only linear sources and linear properties like voltage and current can be summated using the superposition theorem. This is to suggest that Ohm's law for linear sources is cool, whereas power is not cool. Power, being the product of voltage and current, is not a linear property, but rather geometric in nature. The power dissipated by a component from the perspective of an individual source is essentially nonsense, and power effects are not additive. This being said, the final summated voltage and the final summated current, when polarity and direction have been properly accounted for, can be used to solve for final power. Again, considering our earlier example of a 10 ohm resistor being acted upon by three sources, the final voltage of 5 volts and the final current of 0.5 amps can be used to determine that this resistor is ultimately dissipating 2.5 watts of power, and not the summation of 15 times 1.5, plus 7.5 times 0.75, plus 2.5 times 0.25. Any summation of individual powers from individual sources is utter nonsense, because power is a nonlinear property, and the superposition theorem only applies to linear sources and linear properties like Ohm's law. Here's the procedure I use to apply superposition theorem to solve for desired electrical properties. We'll go over each step in detail during the illustrated example problems, however the general steps are as follows. First, identify a source of interest. Then, remove all other sources from consideration. Voltage sources are removed by substituting a short circuit, whereas current sources are removed by substituting an open circuit. Be warned that substituting shorts or opens may fundamentally change the nature of the as-analyzed circuit. It's worth a moment of your time to redraw the circuit at this point. Next, perform series parallel circuit analysis of the as-built circuit for the desired electrical properties. Take note of not only the magnitude, but also the polarity and direction of desired electrical properties. Now go back and repeat these same steps for all the other sources in the circuit. Finally, sum all linear properties, taking into account magnitude, polarity, and direction. Nonlinear properties like power can be solved for at this time. Consider this series parallel circuit with multiple sources. Let's apply a superposition theorem to solve for the voltage drop across and the current through each resistive element. This is one of my favorite circuits to begin the discussion of superposition theorem since it dramatically illustrates the effects of opens and shorts in the as-analyzed circuits. Let's start the analysis from the perspective of the voltage source. This means we need to remove the current source by replacing it with an open. Note when we redraw the as-analyzed circuit, including the open, the nature of the circuit is fundamentally changed in that current travels through R1 and R2 in a purely series fashion, and no current travels through R3. A Kirchhoff's current law analysis of the as-analyzed circuit suggests that IA equals I1, which equals I2, and I3 equals 0 amps. A Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis of the as-analyzed circuit suggests that EA equals V1 plus V2. Given no current travels through R3, V3 equals 0 volts. An application of the voltage divider rule demonstrates that V1 equals 32 volts, positive to negative, left to right. An algebraic rearrangement in the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for the as-analyzed circuit suggests that V2 is the remaining 16 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates I1 is 66.7 milliamperes traveling left to right, and given this is a pure series circuit, I2 can also be said to be 66.7 milliamperes traveling top to bottom. The series parallel analysis from the perspective of the voltage source is now complete and now we can move on to the next step, which necessitates we perform the same analysis for the remaining current source. This means we need to remove the voltage source by replacing it with a short circuit. Note that when we redraw the as-analyzed circuit, including the short, the nature of the circuit is again fundamentally changed. Current produced by the current source must travel through R3, right to left. Current then splits into two paths, one afforded by R1, the other through R2, and returns the current source. 
of Kirchhoff's current law analysis of the as-analyzed circuit suggests that IB equals I3, which equals I1 plus I2. I3 must equal 18 mA traveling right to left. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V3 is 3.6 volts, positive or negative, right to left. An application of the DC current divider rule suggests that I1 is 6 mA traveling right to left. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that V1 is 2.9 volts, positive or negative, right to left. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's current law equation suggests that I2 is the remaining 12 mA traveling top to bottom. Voltage across elements in parallel is the same. R2 being in parallel with R1 also has a voltage drop of 2.9 volts, positive or negative, top to bottom. An application of Ohm's law proves this to be true. V2 is found to be 2.9 volts, positive to negative, top to bottom. Now that we've completed independent analysis of this circuit from the perspective of both sources, the only task that remains us is to summate the effects accounted for magnitude, polarity, and direction. Given the voltage source induces a 32 volt drop positive to negative left to right across R1, and the current source induces a 2.9 volt drop positive to negative right to left across the same resistor, it can be said that when these effects are superimposed upon one another, R1 ultimately experiences a 29.1 volt differential positive to negative left to right. The effects of both sources are opposing one another and it makes sense that the final voltage drop will be less. Similarly, when the voltage source pushes 66.7 mA through R1 left to right and the current source pushes 6 mA of current through R1 right to left, these sources are opposing each other and it can be said when these effects are superimposed upon one another, R1 ultimately experiences 60.7 mA of current left to right. Given the voltage source induces a 16 volt drop across R2, positive or negative, top to bottom, and the current source induces a 2.9 volt drop also across R2, positive or negative, top to bottom, it can be said that when these effects are superimposed upon one another, R2 ultimately experiences an 18.9 volt drop, positive or negative, top to bottom. The effects of both sources are aiding one another and it makes sense that the final voltage drop will be increased. Similarly, when the voltage source pushes 66.7 mA of current through R2 top to bottom and the current source also pushes 12 mA in the same direction, R2 ultimately experiences 78.7 mA of current traveling top to bottom. Again, the effects of both sources are aiding one another and it makes sense that the final current will be more. Lastly, R3 experiences a voltage drop in current because of the current source. As a result, R3 finally experiences a voltage drop of 3.6 volts, positive to negative right to left, and 18 mA of current traveling right to left. If we wanted to, now that we've got final voltage and current values, one could calculate for nonlinear properties like power. Lastly, it should be noted that the final results should make sense, and in no way should they violate fundamental electrical properties like Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's current law, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. As an example, consider an application of Kirchhoff's current law at the top central node. 60.7 mA of current enters from the left through R1. 18 mA of current enters from the right traveling through R3. 78.7 mA of current leaves the top central node traveling through R2 top to bottom. 60.7 plus 18 does in fact equal 78.7. What came in has indeed come out. Ultimately, voltage source A is forcing 60.7 mA of current in a clockwise loop in the following fashion and current source B is forcing 18 mA of current in a counterclockwise loop in the following fashion. And R2, the shared element in both these loops, experiences both currents in an aiding fashion. It makes sense. Before we bring this lecture to a close, allow me to demonstrate a practical application of the superposition theorem. I will readily admit the previous illustrated example, for that matter most illustrated examples of the superposition theorem you find in your average textbook are in practical foolery, only encountered rarely in the field. A lot of superposition theorem examples are simply meant to put your series parallel circuit analysis skills to the test and serve no practical purpose. Not so this one. Consider a series opposing relationship of two voltage sources and a single current controlling resistor in between. We explored such an application in the DC voltage sources in series circuit lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. This is essentially a primitive battery charger. The 14 volt charger on the left hand side forces current into the deeply discharged battery presently at 10 volts on the right hand side. The current controlling resistor, presently set at 4 ohms in between, makes sure current is maintained at a manageable level. We really don't need to use superposition theorems to analyze this circuit, given a Kirchhoff's voltage law analysis could produce usable results quicker. However, Kirchhoff's voltage law and the superposition theorem should both yield the same results. 
Let's see if the superposition theorem rises to the challenge. Traveling in a clockwise loop around the circuit, an application of Kirchhoff's voltage law demonstrates the rise of 14 volts is equal to the voltage drop across the resistor plus the 10 volt drop across the deeply discharged battery. An algebraic rearrangement of the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation subbing for the unknown voltage drop across the resistor demonstrates the resistor experiences a 4 volt differential, positive to negative, left to right. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates one amp of current flows out of the 14 volt charger and into the deeply discharged battery presently at 10 volts. The reversal of current flow in a lead acid battery will reverse the chemical process that occurred during discharge and will recharge the battery. If we left the battery in this state, we might expect the battery voltage to rise over time. Let's see if the superposition theorem yields the same results. Remove the deeply discharged battery from consideration by replacing with a short. The charger would force current in a clockwise direction and the current controlling resistor would experience the full 14 volt differential. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates current will be 3.5 amps traveling clockwise. Let's now to do the same analysis from the perspective of the deeply discharged battery. Remove the charger from consideration by replacing it with a short circuit. In this case, the deeply discharged battery would force current to travel in a counterclockwise direction. And the current controlling resistor would experience all 10 volt differential positive to negative right to left. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates the deeply discharged battery would cause 2.5 amps of current to flow in the system. Now let's summate the results. 14 volts positive to negative left to right minus 10 volts positive to negative right to left demonstrates the current controlling resistor ultimately experiences 4 volts positive to negative left to right. Similarly, 3.5 amps left to right minus 2.5 amps right to left demonstrates the current controlling resistor experiences 1 amp traveling left to right. The results obtained using superposition theorem do indeed match the results obtained using Kirchhoff's voltage law. I've got a reasonable degree of confidence these results are correct. If you've got the time and inclination, one could use techniques like mesh analysis, nodal analysis, or circuit simulation software to again confirm these results. The point being there is one right answer, and regardless of the techniques employed, you should get that one right answer. My affection for the superposition theorem largely stems from this simple fact. If you can perform series parallel circuit analysis, you already know the superposition theorem. You don't need special techniques like mesh or nodal analysis. All you have to do is use series parallel circuit analysis, stay organized, and properly summate the results accounting for polarity and direction. Alright, this concludes the theoretical portion of this lecture. Is that it? No, your acquaintance with the superposition theorem is just beginning. Really, the only way to understand superposition theorem is by doing superposition theorem. In this spirit, stay tuned because I've got another complete lecture coming your way real soon featuring nothing but applications of superposition theorem. Believe me, you'll get plenty of practice. In conclusion, we learned to employ the superposition theorem in an effort to solve our desired electrical quantities for circuits with more than one source. Special use techniques like mesh and nodal analysis can yield the same results, however the superposition theorem does so using techniques you should already feel confident in, notably traditional series parallel circuit analysis. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank you.